Hi everyone, I have got a remastered version of my video, The Antichrist Investigation, for you today. As many of you guys know, last year I was really struggling with my voice, but continued making videos anyway. Now, I'm doing better and I want to re-record my earlier videos so they're easier to watch. The original version of this video can be found on my channel, but this version includes new information and is more concise. So without further ado, I present the Antichrist Investigation with voiceover! My friend and I re-recorded this video so you don't have to sit and read it, but you can follow along with the slides and voiceover. I'm going to talk a little softer to match the tone of the original video. Okay, let's get started. Hi everyone! I'm Alexandra, and in today's video, we are going to be discussing Antichrist. And links to anything I discuss will be in the description below. Let's get started. When it comes to Antichrist, most people fall into one of two categories. The and N. The THE group sees Antichrist as a coming or past evil human ruler. The N Antichrist group sees Antichrist as a spirit, not a human. The term Antichrist comes from the Greek Antichristos. The word Christos is Greek for anointed one. Anti can be translated as any of the following. Over against, opposite, at the same time as, in exchange for, in place of, at the price of, in return for, for the sake of, or for, instead of, or compared with. The word Antichrist only shows up five times in the New Testament, and all of those times are in the Epistle of John. 1 John 2.18 says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Here is the word in the Greek lexicon. An opponent of the Messiah. Take a moment to look at this. Antichrist is one who opposes Christ. This same word does not mean one person, it is the same word used for just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, as well as, even now many Antichrists have appeared. This general term Antichrist is then defined in 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, that denieth the Father and the Son. In this verse, the the, found before Antichrist in some translations, comes from the Greek utos or this, and is probably from a reduplication of ho, which is used as a demonstrative pronoun. A demonstrative pronoun is used for pointing out things. The word this, that, these, and those are demonstrative pronouns. These are my pets. These are sheep, but these are goats. Those are horses. In context, 1 John 2.22 is referring to itself. It's self-contained. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This, meaning this type of person, is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. He's answering his own question. Then, 1 John 4, 3 says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. 2 John 1, 7 for many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. If you deny that Jesus is the Messiah, then you are antichrist. If you deny the existence of the Father and his Son, then you are antichrist. If you deny that Jesus came in the flesh, then you are antichrist. To be antichrist means to be opposed to Christ or to place oneself in his place. According to the Apostle John's writing, there is a spirit of antichrist, which is a spirit of opposition to Christ, that's been around since his time and is still in the world today. 1 John 2.18 Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that antichrist shall come, even now are there many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. 1 John 2.22 Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. 1 John 4.3 And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, 
and even now already is it in the world. 2 John 1 7 For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. The same idea describing this antichrist spirit shows up once in Matthew and once in Mark as pseudo Christos or false Christ, again taking the place of Christ. Matthew 24 24. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Mark 13, 22. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. The Antichrist spirit seeks to take the place of the Holy Spirit. Antihistamines don't kill histamine. They resemble histamine enough that they attach to the cell's receptors so the histamine can't. Within the spiritual realm, the very same thing happens. The Antichrist spirit acts as a Christ replacement. Those are the only verses that address Antichristos and Pseudochristos. The man of sin from 2 Thessalonians is associated with the Antichrist. However, the term Antichrist is not used in these passages. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2-10 through 10, That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition." Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Okay, the events listed in order are 1. A falling away 2 the revealing or uncovering of the son of perdition. 3. The appearance or second coming of Jesus. It sounds like Paul in 2 Thessalonians describes the same characters and events that John describes in the book of Revelation. Let's look at Revelation 13. The ESV version is on the screen, but please feel free to read any version you like. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power, and his throne, and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth, it had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. 
It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak, and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Revelation 13 tells us about the two beasts. Both display the characteristics John warned about, Antichristos and Pseudochristos. Don't get hung up on the words him and he for the first beast. The Greek indicates it is a third-person pronoun that can mean he, she, or it. The angel in Revelation 17.8 describes the first beast from Revelation 13, which is not a human being. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition, some versions say destruction. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. This same imagery is seen earlier in Revelation 9.11. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The word perdition in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 is Strong's number G684, Apollea in Greek. It is a derivative of G622, meaning ruin, loss, destruction, perdition. Revelation 9.11 names the king, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, Apollyon in Greek. The Greek word Apollyon is from the same word used in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 for the son of perdition, Apollea, G622. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-4 describes the same character as Revelation 13, 6-8. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, some versions say destruction, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Revelation 13, 6-8 And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Notice the similar wording as 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The people who worship this first beast are the ones whose names are not written in the book of life. They have the Antichrist spirit within them, not the Holy Spirit. After Jesus' death, resurrection, and giving of the Holy Spirit, God's temple is no longer a building. His spirit dwells in us. 1 Corinthians 3, 16-17 Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. The son of perdition opposes God and that is John's definition of an antichrist. So it's understandable how these two terms were combined. But the specific term, son of perdition, does not refer to one human man, it refers to a spirit of lawlessness. The Bible uses ideas as man, woman, whore, or son many times and is not always talking about literal humans. For example, in Revelation 17, 1-18, Babylon, the whore, is not a woman. The sea, the beast rises from, is people or nations. Israel is not a literal woman. The bride of Christ is not one woman. If these things were literal, the angel in Revelation 17 would not have had to decode the symbolism for John. 
Revelation 17 takes the time to fully explain what the first beast and what the sea represent. Revelation 17.15 The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. This figurative language tells us that the sea the first beast rises from is made up of people from all countries and languages. That's it. The sea is the people of the world. The prostitute, the whore of Babylon, is not a human. It represents the system, the control center, of hierarchical teachings known as the mysteries, Gnosticism, enlightenment, or the forbidden fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, that Adam and Eve accepted in the Garden of Eden. This was the subject of my three-part series Mind Game. You can check that out in the description below. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The mysteries are described as a whore and the mother of prostitutes, which is the opposite of the description used for the true believers in Jesus. They are the bride of Christ. The Bible uses marriage symbolism throughout to describe the relationship God has with his people. For another example, Revelation 19.7 Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. The point is that the Bible often uses imagery and figurative language to describe big concepts. Phrases beginning with sons of are a common Semitic idiom, such as sons of destruction or sons of lawlessness. Recall that the word perdition in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 is apoleia in Greek. It is a derivative of G622, meaning ruin, loss, destruction, and perdition. Revelation 9.11 says the angel of the bottomless pit is called Apollyon in Greek. The Greek word Apollyon is from the same word used in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 for the son of perdition, Apollea. This corresponds to the way John described the spirit of Antichrist, as opposed to a coming human figure. Sometimes the spirit of Antichrist is referred to in the Bible as Belial. For example, 2 Corinthians 6.15 says, What accord has Christ with Belial? Or, what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? And sometimes as the destroyer, wickedness, or worthless one, or man of lawlessness. Belial is a Hebrew word used to characterize the wicked or worthless. The etymology of the word means lacking worth, from two common words, bili, without, and yal, to be of value. So it is to be without value. In the Old Testament, the phrase sons or children of Belial, or sons of worthlessness, worthless men or wicked men, is written 27 times. In the King James Version, Belial is capitalized denoting a proper noun or a name. Here are some more examples of where Belial is found in scripture. But in some modern versions, the name Belial is replaced with worthless and evil men, base fellows, wicked men, troublemakers, or worthless fellows. The pattern here is that this spirit is translated to words like wicked, destruction, perdition, or worthless. This spirit's characteristics, or its fruit, are related to wickedness or lawlessness regarding greed or wealth, sexual immorality, and the destruction of God's temple, our hearts, souls, and minds through spiritual immorality. The spirit represents everything that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are not. It manifests in countless ways, but the root is always that of lawlessness. Not anarchy. Lawless as in without God's law. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hangeth the whole law and the prophets. The law was fulfilled by Jesus, and he says that the whole law is to love God and to love each other. There is no love of God at all in the Antichrist spirit. John warned of the Antichrist around his time, 
and that it will only get worse as time goes on. The only time in the New Testament that the name Belial is used, or Belial in Aramaic, is in 2 Corinthians 6.15. As previously mentioned, 2 Corinthians 6.15 says, What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? The Greek Strong's characterizes Belial as worthless or wicked, and a name of Satan or adversary. And the Hebrew Concordance defines Belial as evil, naughty, ungodly as in men, and wicked, and is used to also mean worthlessness. Worthless, good for nothing, unprofitable, base fellow, wicked, ruin, or destruction. Again, it is a term used for someone who is an unbeliever, including some who think they're believers, but act in such a way that is still antichrist. Someone opposed to God, and since God is Jesus, an unbeliever is an antichrist. Jesus shows us an example of the spirit of an antichrist as the son of perdition. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. John 17, 12. Jesus was talking about Judas, using the idiom to denote an antichrist. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains, how he might betray him unto them. Luke 22, 2-4. In Luke 22.3, Strong's Concordance number G4567 is used here for Satan. The definition is adversary, or one who opposes another in purpose or act, the name given to the prince of evil spirits, the inveterate adversary of God and Christ. Judas was a son of perdition, which is an idiom. Idioms are big ideas expressed in concepts. Judas was an example of what the Antichrist spirit does. Judas allowed himself to be overtaken by Satan, or the adversary of God and Christ, the Antichrist spirit. Jesus referred to that spirit as the son of perdition. It is a name for anyone who is an adversary of God and Christ. Satan is a descriptor, not a name. The son of perdition, of destruction, is characterized as lawless, meaning to not have the law of God. It doesn't love God or humanity. Belial is sometimes referred to by a name and sometimes by attribute, but this spirit is not relegated to the past, or only appearing in the Bible. It is very active in our world today. Its main traits are corruption via wealth, sex, and destroying God in the minds of people. Belial is also a popular idea or demon within the occult. In the Satanic Bible, in the book of Belial, Belial means without a master, and symbolizes independence, self-sufficiency, and personal accomplishment. Of course, modern Satanism is a religion which puts the ego and carnal desires of men first and foremost. It's just self-worship. LeVay uses the term Belial, or worthless, or lawless, as in, without rules. But it really means, without the laws of God. LeVay interprets the lawless definition as without a master, or independent. In the Satanic Bible, the Book of Satan, it says, Choose ye this day, this hour, for no Redeemer liveth. Say unto thine own heart, I am mine own redeemer. The world has spun the interpretation of worthlessness into prideful independence, the epitome of the spirit of Antichrist, through reverence for things like secularism, the New Age, and many other ideologies. The term Satanism or adversarism can apply to much more than just the modern American-made religion of Satanism. When programmer Anton LaVey founded Egotheistic Satanism, or the Church of Satan, in 1966, he uplifted the virtues of pride, indulgence, and rebellion. The basic idea is of individual worship of the self, raising themselves up and establishing their own moral codes based on their own preferences. It's easy to laugh at their exoteric display of selfishness and pride, but the philosophy of Satanism is ingrained in much of society. Those ideas stem from this lawless Antichrist spirit John described. The Antichrist spirit is not always what people might think it is. It comes in the form of material possessions or wealth, sexual immorality, and or anything that leads someone away from God. 
What would John have thought of headlines like Witchcraft Goes Mainstream and Becomes Big Business? The occult isn't something scary or fringe anymore. It's part of our children's entertainment in books like Harry Potter and movies like Halloween Town. The occult is so hot right now. Inside Witch Talk, where the coven goes online. Why Witch Talk self-care is the TikTok subculture to know. Why millennials are ditching religion for witchcraft and astrology. As if that's not religion. Occult aestheticism can be a way of celebrating a shared ideology. The rise of esoteric symbolism and fashion. Ask not what you can do for your country, but what witchcraft can do for you. The man who would be king, for those who don't know, is a story um, with uh, Sean Connery and Michael Caine in it. And it's from an old Rudyard Kipling story. And the Masonic symbol is very important in that movie. And it was literally 20 years later that I looked at the sign of the Deathly Hallows and realized how similar they were. This symbol is also on the Kabbalion, the book of Hermetic Philosophy. It's not all dark or evil looking imagery either. Wickedness comes in many forms. Deception is an act or statement which misleads, hides the truth, or promotes a belief, concept, or idea that is not true. It is often done for personal gain or advantage. Deception can involve dissimulation, propaganda, and sleight of hand, as well as distraction, camouflage, or concealment. In America, the rise of wellness culture and the occult, tarot, astrology, psychic services, Reiki, and more, go hand in hand, Blankholm said. The fact that the occult can be personalized also fits in well with the on-the-go nature of U.S. culture. Translation. The occult is a mix of multiple religions or spiritual practices to create your own religion, even though occultists claim they are not religious, void of any actual truth, and fits in well with the egocentric nature of the U.S. 2 Timothy 4, 3-4 said, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And that's what this world has forgotten. Truth. The world offers little to no resistance to evil. Don't fall into meosophy or atheism. This a culture thrives on consumerism because it's become just another marketing strategy. Bags, crystals, tarot cards, books, t-shirts, makeup, whatever. Astrology gains popularity from time to time in America among teens, but no one talks about the elite who are fully invested in it. The quote, millionaires don't use astrology, billionaires do, describes people like J.P. Morgan and Charles Schwab who sought the guidance of occultists like Evangeline Adams. In her 1926 biography, The Bowl of Heaven, she tells us that, I do know about the late J.P. Morgan's belief in astrology because, well, because I taught it to him. And in his last years, he asked me from Egypt to join him and his party in the Orient, where he had gone on his famous yacht, the Corsair. His idea was to spend several months in a scientific investigation of the occult in those parts of the world where its practice reaches back into prehistoric time. I declined the invitation, not because I didn't appreciate the opportunity, but because I preferred to pursue my own investigations. The point here is all about priorities. What is the priority in your life? What are the actions that define who you are? The difference is living for God or existing for yourself. The love of God takes up the place where the love of the world used to be. You slowly lose interest in things you used to like to the point where you're not interested at all anymore in the same type of music, movies, activities, beliefs, or even thoughts. 1 John 2, 15-17 says, Love not this world, neither the things that are in this world. If any man love this world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in this world, as in lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of this world. And this world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that fulfilleth the will of God abideth ever. He struggled between the forces of good and evil. Many priests believed that his powers didn't come from God at all, and that he was actually 
the Antichrist, writer, and even an undercover spy. He was known as the Great Beast 666 because some believe that he was the Antichrist written about in the book of Revelation. People think it might, you know, is a man or is he already here. Um, it could be a woman. It could operate through a woman. He is the most wicked, most awful person. I mean, take Hitler and Stalin and uh, Mao Zedong and all those people, yeah. wrap them all up to one and then multiply them and you won't even come close to the awful uh, character of this man. And he's going to gain control of this world and everyone will be under his domination because if they aren't, they won't be able to function. Throughout history, some individuals regarded as tyrannical, wielding great power and influence have been labeled as potential antichrists. In the 20th century, it was uh, uh, Hitler and Mussolini and uh, more recently, uh, Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi. In every generation there have been people that people have tried to identify as the Antichrist and I've heard all kind of names thrown around in my lifetime even but none of that plays into the other pieces that go into the puzzle. Until the 20th century if the Antichrist was identified with a specific figure it was usually directed at the papacy or figures like Stalin or Nero. So tell me about this coding because as I understand it the Antichrist was given a, a code, so they would never call his name. They would just say it by code. Well, there has been a lot of debate about what this number, in particular 666, who it refers to. There has also been a strong argument made for 666 referring to Nero. This clip mushes the mark, the first beast, and the second beast that causes the mark together and creates unnecessary and unscriptural confusion. What do you expect from National Geographic, a joint venture with Disney? The mainstream media has played a huge role in creating a personification of the Antichrist that has taken on a life of its own. The Bible does not say the Antichrist will be the son of Satan, but the idea was made popular in at least two movies, The Omen and its sequels, with the evil child Damien and Rosemary's baby with her son Adrian. The Holy Spirit helps us focus on what is lawful, or honoring to God, and what counts for eternity. The Antichrist spirit tells us to focus on the fleeting moment and any indulgence we desire or think we desire. This spirit murders its victims slowly in four ways, mental, moral, spiritual, and physical. It's important to always keep your guard up and your spiritual armor on. This battle is not just empirical, it's also ephemeral. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against the worldly governors, the princes of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, which are in high places. Antichrist is not limited to one single person. John uses the term to describe anyone who forgets, opposes, or replaces the teachings of Jesus. And we live in an Antichrist world. Antichrist imagery has been shoved in our faces for so long, but some still don't recognize it for what it is. Keep sharing the truth, even though it's easier to remain silent. Looking again at 2 Corinthians 6.15, what accord has Christ with Belial? or what does Christ have to do with the spirit of Antichrist, in 2018, Arkansas installed a new Ten Commandments monument at its capital, and Satanists were asking to have their own monument placed there, to have equal rights. At first glance, this monument doesn't seem too controversial. State officials have put up a Ten Commandments monument on government property. Satanists are demanding equal rights. But did you notice anything? Hell Satan. Hell Satan. This Hail Satan clip is from the documentary called Hail Satan, about the Satanic Temple. So my question is, why is the same symbol you're protesting on your t-shirt? The pyramid with the Eye of Providence or the pyramid with illumination behind it. Why is a symbol shared by the most powerful banks and media companies on the Ten Commandments monument? Because our nation was not founded on the Word of God, the truth, and Jesus Christ. It was founded as the great Masonic experiment of the mystery religion. I discussed this in An Inconvenient History. Thomas Jefferson, the third U.S. president, created his own Bible by literally cutting out any mention of the miracles of Jesus, his resurrection, or ascension. 
He glued the pages back together, leaving only references to Jesus as a human man of morals, a teacher, but nothing about his miracles or the supernatural powers of God. The original Pledge of Allegiance was written by Freemason Francis Bellamy. One nation under God did not exist when the Pledge of Allegiance was first written. While the original was written in honor of Christopher Columbus, it wasn't until 1954 that the phrase under God was added. According to this Freemasonic article, the pledge was originally composed in 1892 by Reverend Francis J. Bellamy, a member of Little Falls Lodge No. 181 in Little Falls, New York. The original version of this pledge was simple. I pledge allegiance to the flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Many of the founding fathers were deists, occultists, and freemasons, just like the hierarchy of rulers and monarchs across the world. This culture of antichrist comes from the top down worldwide. It can be seen as a form of cultural hegemony, which is the domination of a culturally diverse society by the ruling class who manipulate the culture of that society. I've talked about the founding of America in my older video on Inconvenient History, but I highly suggest you do your own research into this topic. More often than not, these Antichrist ideas, agendas, and actions are presented as anything other than evil. Usually, it offers something the society wants, or thinks they want, on the surface. Before we can look at where the modern cultural phenomenon of Antichrist comes from, we have to go back to the origin. When did John's description of an Antichrist turn into a specific THE Antichrist? Where did this come from? Let's look at how this idea originated. In order to do that, we have to go back in history to the early days of the church, beginning with Polycarp. He knew the apostles and specifically John. Polycarp warned the Philippians that anyone who preached a false doctrine was an antichrist. Polycarp used the term exactly as John did, not identifying a single person as the antichrist, but making it clear that it was a type of person who rejected Jesus who had the spirit of Antichrist that was at work in the world then. 1 John 4, 3 And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. One of Polycarp's students was Irenaeus, another early church father who wrote extensively about Gnostic heresies infiltrating the new church. Irenaeus is the first one who equated Antichrist with a human and tried to assign a person's name to the number 666. His opinions have been passed down to this day. In his writings, Against Heresies, Book 5, Chapter 30, he states, quote, Moreover, another danger, by no means trifling, shall overtake those who falsely presume that they know the name of Antichrist. For if these men assume one, a number, when the Antichrist shall come having another, they will easily be led away from him, as supposing him not to be the expected one who must be guarded against. After Irenaeus, Tertullian started teaching. He was the first one to combine the man of lawlessness, or the man of sin, as a single human being, which he called the Antichrist. Notice he capitalized Antichrist, which is not capitalized in scripture. This seemingly small change called reverential capitalization, made with inverse commentary, turned a concept into a human. For that day shall not come, unless indeed there first come a falling away. He means indeed of this present empire. And that man of sin be revealed, that is to say, Antichrist, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or religion, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, affirming that he is God. Remember ye not, when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? After Tertullian, Hippolytus misidentified a human antichrist with the second beast John saw in Revelation 13, the beast of the earth. By the beast, then, coming up out of the earth, he means the kingdom of antichrist, and by the two horns he means him and the false prophet after him. With his incorrect commentary, he combined the first and second beasts together, which the scriptures don't do. Revelation 13 is very specific about one beast from the sea and one from the earth. Polycarp was the only early church father who used the word antichrist to mean exactly what the scriptures said it meant. The others after him, Arrhenius, Tertullian, and Hippolytus, took more liberty with the scriptures by adding their opinions. The same idea describing this Antichrist spirit shows up once in Matthew and once in Mark as Pseudo-Christos, or False Christ, 
again taking the place of Christ. Matthew 24, 24 and Mark 13, 22. The most popular doctrine of beliefs taught today is called dispensationalism. It traces back to the early 1500s when the Catholic Church was losing its power due to the Protestant Reformation. During the Inquisition, the Catholic Church killed hundreds of thousands of heretics, people who disagreed with them. As a result, the Catholic Church and the papacy were called the Antichrist system by Protestants, Muslims, and Jews. The official story states that the Order of the Jesuits was founded in 1540 by a Spanish knight named Ignatius Loyola to counter Protestants' beliefs. During the Council of Trent, beginning in 1554, the Jesuits commissioned by the Pope to develop a new interpretation of scripture that would counteract the Protestants claims that the Roman Catholic Church fulfilled the Bible's prophecies of an Antichrist. At the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church gave the Jesuits the specific assignment of bringing Protestantism back to the quote Mother Church. This was to be done not only through the Inquisition and through torture, but also through theology and deception. In 1590, Francisco Rivera, a Jesuit, published a 500-page Latin commentary on Revelation called In Sacrum Vidi Ioannis Apostoli and Evangeliste Apocalypsin Commentary. His commentary was never translated into any other language and was for the eyes of the Catholic hierarchy only. Ribera said that all of Revelation was in the future and that since the papacy was timeless, it couldn't be the Antichrist since the Antichrist had to be a single, identifiable human being who would come during the tribulation. He also claimed that the destroyer would be a Jew and appear in Jerusalem. He would rebuild Jerusalem, be worshipped by the Jews, abolish Christianity, and persecute Christians. Then he would take over the world until Jesus returns. Jesuit Cardinal Bellarmine added to Rivera's writing, stating the Antichrist would be an evil man who would reign for seven years at the end of time in the distant future. This goes against scripture, which says, 1 John 4, 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. In the early 1700s, another Spanish Jesuit, Manuel de la Cunza, compared his own views on the identity of the Antichrist with Rivera's views, and wrote the controversial book, The Coming of the Messiah in Majesty and Glory, under the pseudonym of a converted Jewish rabbi, Ben Ezra. From this book came the emergence of modern dispensationalism. Lacunza's book was a big influence on Scottish minister Edward Irving. He translated The Coming of Messiah in Glory from Spanish to English and published it in 1827. Irving called Ben Ezra his worthy master, a free Islamic term, in the preface to his translation of The Coming of Messiah in Glory. Irving repeated the word dispensation 13 times on a single page of the preface he wrote for Lacunza's book. Irving was fascinated, or obsessed, with the new idea that would become dispensationalism. Irving was charismatic and drew large crowds to his Caledonian chapel in London, like most megapastors. Lacunza's ideas, spread through Irving, would not have become the most popular theory without the aid of a wealthy Freemasonic banker named Henry Drummond. Drummond is listed as a fellow in the Royal Society of Freemasons. As you can see here at the last sentence, he was a member of the Lodge of Friendship No. 3, now No. 6, in London. Irving admits he preached the doctrine of dispensationalism from Lacunza's book at the Albury Conference. Freemason Henry Drummond financed and organized the conference for Irving. So the doctrine of dispensationalism was presented by Irving at the Albury Conference, which is where John Nelson Darby heard it. Here is a summary of the purpose of Lacunza's book. During the Reformation, Luther, Wycliffe, Tyndall, Calvin, Wesley, and others came to believe that the papacy was the Antichrist system found in Scripture. During the Council of Trent in 1545-63, through 63, the papacy fought back against the Reformation through a counter-reformation. One effort was to provide an alternative Antichrist. A Jesuit named Francisco Ribera wrote a book promoting a future single Antichrist figure who would rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Another Jesuit named Louis Alcazar wrote a book on Bible prophecy which promoted the preterist view that many of the prophecies had already been fulfilled in the past. Manuel Lacunza, also a Jesuit, used concepts from Ribera's book within his book, The Coming of Messiah and Glory and Majesty. 
It was published in Spanish during 1812 and was published in English through the efforts of Edward Irving in 1827. Essentially, Jesuits were enlisted by the Catholic Church to rewrite doctrine so the papacy would no longer be called the Antichrist. The Reformation leaders like Luther, Wycliffe, and Tyndale believed the Catholic Church was the Antichrist system because of their centuries-long inquisitions and killed hundreds of thousands of people it believed to be heretics. The Jesuits were recruited to infiltrate Protestantism and to spread dispensationalism and preterism, placing the Antichrist either in the future or the past, taking the blame off the present and the papacy. Side note, preterism, also created by a Jesuit, but Louis Alcazar is the belief that says that all or most of Revelation was fulfilled in the first century. The Catholic Church is an Antichrist. It is far too myopic to assume they are the end-all be-all of the Antichrist system. It's just one part of the beast system. Thanks to Drummond's funding of the prophecy conferences in Albury, John Nelson Darby, the man who would be called the father of dispensationalism, heard Irving preach. This is confirmed in the pro-dispensationalism book by Charles Ryrie. It was not until several years after leaving the Church of England that Darby became interested in prophecy. His interest was piqued through conferences at Albury, out of which the Irvingian movement grew. Darby was an Irish aristocrat who adopted Edward Irving's, originally Jesuit, dispensationalist teachings and preached them extensively. According to his own words, Darby was also a student of the mysteries. Link to the full article is in the description below, but essentially, John Nelson Darby, the father of dispensationalism, used occult language throughout his doctrinal writings and letters. The majority of the phrases are found in Kabbalistic or Theosophical literature. John Nelson Darby learned these esoteric terms somewhere, not from the Bible, and he deliberately integrated them into his theological treatises and letters. His practice of merging theosophical vocabulary with supposed biblical teaching is a form of syncretism. Theosophical terms used by Darby include architect, heavenly architect, Divine Intelligence, The Coming One. Here are some of the terms he used compared to Theosophy. Darby lived in a castle dubbed Ireland's Most Haunted Castle, complete with many bizarre stories of skeletons inside walls and sightings of an elemental creature or a demon. Darby was told about a Scottish woman, Margaret MacDonald, who had visions of the rapture and that Christians would be gathered secretly before Jesus' second coming. Considering the fact Margaret MacDonald was a channeler, or a spirit medium, the catalyst of this vision would not have been God. Darby was dubbed the father of dispensationalism, but in reality, he simply popularized Jesuit eschatology. Darby's ideas were further promoted and accepted in the United States in the early 20th century when Cyrus Schofield published his Schofield Reference Bible. Schofield was best known for his Schofield Reference Bible. He was an American theologian, minister, and writer whose best-selling annotated Bible popularized futurism and dispensationalism amongst fundamental Christians. He was also a lawyer and a politician. It was largely through the influence of Schofield's notes that dispensational premillennialism became influential among fundamental Christians in the United States, and these notes became a significant source for popular religious writers such as Hal Lindsey. Schofield's reference Bible introduced many to Zionism and Christian Zionism. Christian Zionists believe that the return of the Jews to the state of Israel in 1948 were in concordance with biblical prophecy. One of the ideas Schofield popularized is that Daniel 9.27 refers to the Antichrist in his commentary. Before Schofield, most theologians believed the he in Daniel 9.27 was Jesus. The majority of them believed the he discussed in Daniel 9.27 was Jesus. If those theologians were correct, then Schofield turned Jesus into the Antichrist. The occult inverts the truth, and the Jesuits and Freemasons who created the theory of dispensationalism have always seen Jesus as the Antichrist because they see themselves as God. The origins of the dispensational theory are three Jesuit priests, Ribera, Bellarmine, Lacunza, a Freemason, Henry Drummond, the Freemason's pawn, Edward Irving, a Theosophist, Darby, and a scandal-ridden ex-lawyer, Cyrus Schofield, who was later funded by Zionist Samuel Untermeyer. Samuel Untermeyer was a Zionist 
scientist who found Schofield through a network of contacts like Mordecai Kaplan and Louis Marshall in the Jewish Theological Seminary, which he helped build and support financially. Untermeyer was given the job of injecting political Zionist beliefs into Christianity, thus creating Christian Zionism. Samuel Untermeyer introduced Schofield to the ideology of Zionism and to socialist world leaders. Even with Schofield's shady past, a criminal record, and the fact that he had never been to seminary, the Zionists were able to control the press, do some public relations work, and along with their international network, he became one of America's leading theologians, despite his dubious and unqualified nature. Schofield introduced the idea of dispensationalism to the masses easily, which includes the secret rapture and a rebuilding of a third temple, through his commentary in his reference Bible, which was printed by Oxford University Press in London, which is owned by Freemans. According to Joseph M. Canfield, who wrote the biography, The Incredible Schofield in his book, Quote, Schofield's theology was most helpful in getting fundamentalist Christians to back the international interest in one of Untermeyer's pet projects, the Zionist movement. Here is a summary of dispensationalism. It is a literal interpretation of the Bible. God works via different arrangements in distinct periods of history, or dispensations. Israel is the literal descendants of Abraham, not spiritual ones. Israel is the heir to the promises made to Abraham about the seed being blessed. Participation in the Abrahamic covenant is mainly by physical birth and Jewish lineage. Dispensationalism says there are two distinct people groups, Israel and the church. Believe the church began at Pentecost. Salvation is by faith in accordance to the revelation given in a particular dispensation. The Holy Spirit did not indwell people in all dispensations, only during the dispensation of the Church Age. The Antichrist is an evil man who will rule for seven years before the end of the world. A core part of dispensationalism is that the Third Temple will be rebuilt when the Antichrist secures a peace treaty between Israel, the nation, not the people, and its neighbors following a war. The Antichrist later uses the Temple as a venue for proclaiming himself as God, demanding worship from humanity. This particular belief was made even more popular by dispensationalist theologians such as Hal Lindsey and Tim LaHaye. Christ will reign in the future for a 1,000 year period which occurs after the rapture. The Catholic Church, via the Jesuits, created a lie that went viral with the help of Freemasons and is believed by many today. The rapture, as in a secret rapture before the Second Coming, is a 19th century invention by the Catholic Church and the Zionists. These ideas are part of a relatively new philosophy called dispensationalism, and was made popular by various occultists, as we just discussed. Dispensationalism is a broad belief system incorporating many of today's unquestioned beliefs found within mainstream Christianity. Christians before the 19th century did not believe in the tenets put forth in dispensationalism, such as a secret rapture or the rebuilding of a third temple, for example. Dispensationalism also teaches that history is divided into seven periods or dispensations. The reason dispensationalism got so popular is because of the infiltration over the last century of seminaries and churches by occultists like John D. Rockefeller and Samuel Untermeyer, along with societies like the Freemasons. The same way medical schools don't teach healing medicine, but they do teach Big Pharma, to make money and have control, the seminaries don't teach pastors the whole truth, they teach watered-down doctrines created by occultists for the same reason as Big Pharma pushes illness creating drugs, to make money and have control. The same man, John D. Rockefeller Sr., is responsible for what medical schools teach, as well as the seminaries. He founded them both. He also founded our modern education school system. This family does not have the truth or your best interest in mind. In America, the Moody Bible Institute, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, now Biola University, and Dallas Theological Seminary played important roles in spreading dispensationalism. Gradually, other schools and even entire denominations embraced the system. Adrian Rogers, Charles Stanley, and W.A. Criswell were among the most prominent Southern Baptist dispensationalists. Although dispensationalism likely is the most popular eschatological position among Southern Baptists today, Garrett noted that it was a new development in the 19th century with no antecedent in the Baptist past. You had Graves, 
You had J. Frank Norris, and then you had W.A. Criswell espousing dispensationalism, he said. But nobody back behind that period was at all inclined, and I would argue the reason is because it didn't come before the 19th century in Britain. Occultists and mystics are the ones who have looked forward to the false goal of rebuilding the temple. However, those groups know the temple is inside humanity, or their hearts, which they call Solomon's Temple. The most enduring narrative of dispensationalism is that of a single human that is evil incarnate, the Antichrist, which is why that's the ism we focused on today. The problem with dispensationalism, and its sister theory preterism, or any false teachings, is that they water down the word of God and elevate the doctrines of men. Satan always hides behind a facade, and he does not need a password or dues card to enter the lodge in order to grip the hearts and minds of masons. Since this is true, it is of utmost importance for us to discern how the devil has used Freemasonry to distort the biblical record. Satan is not interested in destroying other faiths, he already knows that they are counterfeit. He only cares about deceiving Christians, hence the use of Bible scripture twisting in Freemasonry, which is one of Satan's craftiest works of art. Rather than using the bogus volumes of sacred law of other religions, Freemasonry uses the real thing, the true inspired word of God, the Holy Bible. Jesuits and Freemasons are responsible for infiltrating churches. Freemasonry is also largely responsible for distributing the Luciferian religion throughout the world. This was the topic of my mind game series. Before we move on, I want to make sure that you guys know that I'm talking about esoteric agendas, the core beliefs of the Luciferian systems, not the people who don't know any better. I'm not talking about those who go to church. I'm talking about people who have set up the entire modern church system. The best way to combat this is to take everything you hear and compare it with scripture. My criticism is directed at the Luciferians who set up the institutions that go on to instruct the instructors of today and yesterday. I'm not criticizing the exoteric masses inside an organization, but the esoteric core at the heart of it, using the exoteric as a smokescreen. Seminaries are places where well-known pastors or other, quote, Christian figures get their start. However, where did seminaries in the United States get their start? Who is teaching those who claim to teach the Bible? Freemasonry, via the Rockefeller family, established many theological seminaries. From these seminaries come the teachings passed throughout churches via occultists like the Jesuits, Freemasons, and Zionists, and believed as doctrine. John D. Rockefeller Sr. professed to be a Baptist, but you can see by his tombstone obelisk who he really worshipped. He was behind the funding for many seminaries. He basically got them started in the U.S. But why? Because he's made it a monopoly. This time frame corresponds to the infiltration of many churches and the spreading of the mysteries into scripture and teaching doctrines contrary to the Bible. Again, we talked about this in my video in A Convenient History. Theological schools were funded by John D. Rockefeller Jr. This family is extremely financially invested in starting and continuing seminaries. The Dallas Theological Seminary is known for popularizing dispensationalism. It was founded by Louis Schaefer, whose mentor was Cyrus Schofield. You may recognize many Dallas Seminary alumni. Dispensationalism, among other isms, was invented as a self-preservation technique by the Catholic Church to remain in power. Upon examination, Dispensationalism is not scriptural. However, it is taught in seminaries as if it is. It is then taught to the masses, and the cycle continues. Lies are passed on generationally. Traditions ensure each generation gets the same indoctrination as the previous ones. Dispensationalism is a tradition, not a fact. Cognitive dissonance can be powerful when faced with information that challenges a worldview, and many may not know they believe or were taught a doctrine called dispensationalism. 
Dispensationalism is preached by the majority of churches in America and is the most popular mainstream Christian belief due to the infiltration of churches over time through Jesuits and Freemasons. In Europe, Jesuits started many colleges where this belief was taught. Freemasonry is well known for their incredible marketing and propaganda techniques. Many don't realize they have internalized these beliefs, but knowing these beliefs are part of an ism, the viewer is encouraged to continue researching this topic. With the control of seminaries giving out talking points in the form of theological education, every pastor sticks to the script, and the script of today is dispensationalism. And the man of sin revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. All the world marveled because they saw it. And there were generations, I'm telling you, before we existed that would read that verse and say, how's that going to happen? Well, now it's clear how that's going to happen. CNN's going to cover it. When that temple is restored, then ultimately the Antichrist will go into that temple and be revealed. He'll be revealed in that temple that's been restored, which actually could begin in its construction process prior to the church being removed but not fully because we know we're restraining that evil one from being revealed that ultimately he is revealed in that temple. Then that Antichrist who has been revealed will require that mark to be received. And you ain't buying anything without that mark. The way that the Antichrist is going to control all mankind is by establishing a number. And if you swear allegiance to him, you get this prefix added to your personal number, which allows you to buy, sell, and hold a job. Personally, I believe that it's very possible that right now, Antichrist could be alive on this planet. The Apostle Paul also prophetically saw the beast and what it would be like when he came. He says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, And the man of lawlessness, there he is. That's the Antichrist. Lawlessness. Lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction. He bears the resemblance of his father, the devil. Antichrist will be the man of lawlessness. He's going to change all the good laws into bad laws. He's going to be the son of destruction just like his father. He will outlaw the worship of any other god and he will claim to be God himself and he will demand that all the world will worship him. Why would Lucifer outlaw worship of himself? The One World Religion was discussed in my Mind Game series. I suggest starting from part one and working your way through part three. There will appear a person on this earth who shall become a world leader whom the Bible refers to as the Antichrist. I believe scripture teaches that he will not make his full appearance known until the church is gone. There's nothing prophetically that has to take place. Nothing needs to take, there's not one prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. For the Lord to call us out of this world at his coming for his own. Before Jesus comes back in the rapture, are you ready? Seven years later he'll be coming with his own that starts the Great Tribulation, and the end of the Great Tribulation will come. John 3.16 is the truth. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish. Just as true, the Antichrist is going to make His appearance on this earth. God has His Son, Jesus, and one day, listen, Satan will have His Son. The question is, is He already among us? This man will be history's vilest embodiment of sin and rebellion. He'll do what no other man has ever been able to do before. He'll bring global peace. He'll solve the Middle East peace puzzle. He will rid the world of terrorism. He will be so successful, he will be hailed as the greatest peacemaker who has ever lived. No doubt he'll win the Nobel Peace Prize. He will be a satanic superman. He will even get the Jewish nation and Arab nations to sign a peace treaty, paving the way for the long-awaited third temple. But behind that is the most evil man who has ever walked this earth. In a U.S. News and World Report that was done a while back, 49% of Americans said there will be an Antichrist sometime in the future. 
According to a poll conducted earlier this year by Lifeway Research, nearly half of Protestant pastors surveyed believe the Antichrist figure will arise sometime in the future. 49% of Americans said nearly half of Protestant pastors surveyed Americans pastors. The poll states that pastors were surveyed. That will obviously be biased based on their education system. The poll did not survey Americans as the pastor claimed. And that's distinct from some of the other responses because they, they were thinking of, of, of a single figure and that it's in the future. Church media promotes the same talking points. For example, premillennial dispensational ideas were popularized in the 1972 film called A Thief in the Night. Produced and directed by Donald W. Thompson, a generation before Tim LaHaye's Left Behind series of novels and films in 1995. Thompson worked for the U.S. Air Force in their motion pictures division. Again, media shaping the minds of many. Hal Lindsey, Dallas Seminary alumnus, is a popular TV host, dispensationalist, and Christian Zionist. He is known for his many predictions that the rapture would happen in the 1980s and 1990s. In 1970, he published the book The Late Great Planet Earth, which is really a popularization of John Darby's system. And a decade later, he wrote the 1980s Countdown to Armageddon. According to Lindsay's IMDb, which stands for Internet Movie Database, two of his daughters went to Gonzaga University, a Jesuit college. Dispensationalism began with the Jesuits. In 16th century Spain, Jesuit priests of Jewish descent played a central role in forming the education, spirituality, and philosophy that are integral to the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. How Lindsay perpetuates the unscriptural basis that the Antichrist gives the mark. Revelation 13 is clear. The second beast, or the false prophet system, gives the mark. As you can see here on the screen, Revelation 13, 11 through 18 shows us it's the second beast that causes the mark. The one that looks like the lamb, but speaks like the dragon. In 1995, Tim LaHaye modernized dispensationalism and introduced the idea to a new generation of Christians. Tim LaHaye uses Masonic iconography. One example is the cross and crown he uses on one of his books, shown here. And here is the same symbol in a lodge. People internalize the messages from these sources and incorporate them into their worldview. Theology cannot be taken from movies or books created by Freemasons. The fruit that comes from the Dallas Theological Seminary is the same ethos of Freemasonry. The alumni go on to be quite influential, all with either book deals, large churches, TV shows, or more. Instead of reading people's opinions about scripture or apocalyptic fiction, just read scripture. Another well-known Dallas alumnus and preacher of dispensationalism is David Jeremiah. Who is Pastor David Jeremiah? Most know him as the pastor of Shadow Mountain Community Church and the host of the popular radio program, Turning Point. He has an earned bachelor degree from Cedarville University, a master's from Dallas Theological Seminary, and an honorary doctor of divinity from Cedarville University. In 1981, he inherited the pastorship of Shadow Mountain from Tim LaHaye of Left Behind fame, who stepped down in 1981 after 25 years of pastoring. That same year, David Jeremiah was given an honorary doctorate from Cedarville, where previously his father had been president from 1953 to 1978. The previous information can be found on David Jeremiah's Wikipedia profile and on the Cedarville University website. There are a number of red flags that go up regarding David Jeremiah. Firstly, Shadow Mountain Church displays an all-seeing eye and an inverted crucifix on a stained glass window, prominently featured behind and above the pulpit. There is no mistake about it, and many images can be viewed in David's services posted on YouTube and on various other internet sources. Most know that the all-seeing eye and the inverted crucifix are associated with occultism, and particularly the Freemasons. To get a broader perspective of this questionable symbolism found at Shadow Mountain Community Church, one need look no farther than Tim LaHaye, Jeremiah's predecessor, who used the cross and crown symbols on the cover of his 1998 book titled, The Power of the Cross. The cross and the crown displayed exactly as Tim LaHaye has done is the emblem of the Knights Templar, an occult order that many have linked to the Freemasons. 
In fact, some Masonic temples feature the Templar logo inside their buildings. When it comes to the idea of Antichrist, who benefits? Why is the human Antichrist camp the idea Freemasons teach? In my opinion, at the highest esoteric level, a coming, literal, human Antichrist is the perfect scapegoat to throw the blame onto or for the present Antichrists to hide behind. We shift the blame from the real Antichrists who control this world onto some future figure. Another common sleight of hand magic trick. Look for the Antichrist and don't worry about what's going on under your feet, what your money is funding, or who controls your every move, and in some cases, every thought. They want you to blame a puppet, not the puppet masters. Daniel requires its own careful study and exploration. Everyone has an opinion, and everyone has an interpretation. Dispensationalism places far too much importance on the commentary of the book of Daniel, rather than the book itself, such as the gap theory. The book of Daniel is missing several chapters in modern translations, and many words are up to interpretation. For example, the Greek Septuagint does not include the word he. The King James and other versions added he. It is beyond the scope of this video to do Daniel any justice. It cannot be summarized in a few slides. The idea of Antichrist being one man was not taught by the apostles. The idea of Antichrist has been with us since before the days of Jesus. The spirit of Antichrist is in direct opposition to God. The world is in direct opposition to God. The media, governments, elite bankers, and influential people have all created a system that runs on wealth, sexual immorality, and the targeted destruction of God in the minds of the people. Questioning doctrine is not the same as questioning scripture. This investigation was to uncover the sources of the idea of a human antichrist and the dispensation doctrine. Scripture stands up to examination. Don't be afraid of asking questions. Separating religion from Jesus and following him instead of denominational ideas can be scary for those who have depended on men's interpretations for years, but it is possible. The truth can't hurt you, but it can make you uncomfortable at first, but ultimately, it is freeing. Like all of my videos, we deal with the fire, not the smoke. When you find out the origins of these doctrines, they have no merit. They're worthless. Hopefully this video has given you some useful information and resources to do your own investigation and come to your own conclusions. Nobody agrees 100% regarding the end times, so whatever camp you're in, what really matters is that we love Jesus, that we love others, and keep him as our top priority. He will return, and we are to watch for his return and ultimately live our lives accordingly. Thanks again for watching this. Till next time, everyone. Take care. Bye.